everyone, and welcome to this week's Fireside Creators. I am your host, Reverend Dr. Sherry Pallas. For this week's show, I am chatting with Dr. Jennifer Bird about her latest book, Marriage in the Bible, What Do the Texts Say? Please remember to keep all comments and questions related to the show topic and that this is a safe space. Thank you for joining us, and I'm looking forward to all of your comments and questions. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe. If you're on Facebook, grant StreamYard access so we can see your name when you have a comment or have a question. I want to give a huge shout out to my top sponsors, Ruth, Kirsten, Michelle, Ray, and Heidi. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your support. If you would consider supporting me, you can go to sherrypalace.com and there you will find literally dozens of ways to do so for as, as little as $3 a month. So thank you in advance and thank you for welcoming us into your home and joining the conversation. I appreciate you all. Okay, let's meet our guest and get smarter. Dr. Jennifer Bird is an independent scholar who was born and reared in the South and currently resides in the Pacific Northwest. She has a BS in mathematics and a minor in education from Virginia Tech and an MDiv from Princeton Technology, Technology Theological <laughs> Seminary and a PhD in New Testament and Early Christianity from Vanderbilt University. She spent seven years leading and evangelizing in the parachurch ministry and 20 plus years teaching in higher ed, doing intersectional work about gender, sex, sexuality, biblical studies, and cultural studies. All over, I'm adding this, but she's one boss bitch. I am so glad she's here. <laughs> Welcome back, Jennifer. How are you? Hi. Thank you so much, Sherry, for your sweet. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me back. <laughs> you know, a strong woman would only be thanking me for that. So that is really <laughs> even more so well, of course. that you are. Who doesn't <laughs> want to be called a boss? So know. I je I'm so thankful that you wrote mm. this book. Um, mm. I opened my book with talking about the damages that are done around the biblical beliefs of marriage mm -hmm. and how I um, was raped in the name of the Bible. I was property in the name of the Bible because we were married. He mm -hmm. instantly thought that he took ownership of me and I believed it too. Exactly. I was going to say, and you played along because that's yeah, I totally believed it. I mean, it, it well. was year, decades actually, when I was talking to someone and saying, "Well, you know, he forced me to have sex," and sometimes I would be laying there crying, and they're like, "That's rape," and I'm like, "What?" <laughs> I didn't even realize because it was so <laughs> ordained by God. I was supposed to be in my biblical woman and be in this type of role. That and he's gone now, and I would think that even he would laugh. He would never have thought in a million years that he did that to me. Mm. But technicalities are it was, even though it was justified in the name of God. So you putting this out there is just so important. And mm. thank you for doing so. Mm. Tell me about why you did it. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, so th actually the reason that I got started on this was I was living in North Carolina in the year 2012 when the, there was um, an amendment up for a vote, the first um, amendment to the state constitution. And the, uh, the language would um, indirectly defined marriage as between only, only between a man and a woman. So state constitutional <laughs> amendment uh, endorsing hetero marriages only. And so I went to forums ahead of time, you know, I went to conversations to hear what people on both sides were saying. And in particular, I was very curious. I mean, I thought I knew, but I was curious how people who were for this amendment were justifying it. And yeah, I heard exactly what I expected to hear, which is, they were doing this God ordained and it says in the Bible kind of language. And I remember, you know, a couple of times I was like, wow, that is painfully vague and just not accurate, you know? And so that isn't the time you're going to change someone's mind, right? Like we're a yeah. couple months before the vote. Nobody's actually having a conversation. I was just trying to figure out what was going on. So, um, 
and no one's changing their mind at this point. But that was kind of like I wrote a piece. I posted something on Facebook, actually. You know, like there are these two or three things about this uh, this vote, this amendment that are problematic for me. And and I just did a quick, you know, quick fee, you know, quick little thought. And a friend of mine, this was back when Huffington Post was actually a little bit better respected than I think it is now. Are they still around? <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the yes from yesteryear. I know, right? <laughs> yes, I might not even know what that is. Um, listening to this, so a, a friend who um, had been an editorial contributor and so knew the guy on the religion desk um, connected me with him and and got me my first, you know, contributing editor piece at Huffington Post, and it went viral, like nice two hundred thousand. I mean, re- viral for me, you know. I think yeah. someone contacted me and said, "Oh my gosh, Jen, you're tread- you're trending on Reddit." <laughs> I was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> for five minutes, but you know, yeah. like it. anyway, so, you know, what that did was opened up very much. Um, I had already been trying to work around, trying to figure out how to be more of a public scholar prior to that for many years. And this was kind of my end. I was like, okay, this is something I can do well. I know how to do that. You know, like I can have these conversations and I can do, there's some, there's some need and desire for this kind of public scholarship. So on this topic. So that was, that was 2012. And so then I spent the next eight, 10, 10 years trying to figure out how to do more than just put an editorial out there. Like what else can I do that would be helpful for people who really do want some information on this? And so I was primarily working, doing things like speaking at, uh, congregations. So specific congregations that were open and inviting, open and welcoming Methodist, actually an American Baptist, Cooperative Baptist Church. Um, yeah, UCC, Presbyterians. Like I was just t- teaching and speaking anywhere I could. And what that told me was there's way too much to try to put into one hour, right? There's way too much. So then so then that kind of led to all these different things. I got to keynote one place and this one guy was like, you know, Dr. Bird, that was really informative, but I really need to sit down and look at the text myself. And I was like, yes, you do. So how do I help him do that? Like, how can I? So that led to me creating, you know, led to all these different things. I created a seminar, a weekend seminar. Again, too much, too fast. So that led to me creating a video series and then the book, which is a video series kind of lines up with it. There are 10 different videos in the series and a conclusion intro. And chapter one in my book is the same content as on the video, but just goes much deeper and also more broad. So the video series was created for people of faith specifically. Like I kept Methodists and Presbyterians in mind mm-hmm. as I wrote those scripts and did that. Um, but the book itself is for a wider audience. It's it's yeah. very much for, uh, I have political things in mind as I'm writing right so who how many people can i reach with this language and this topic and this conversation helping them understand why this matters or you know or what and what to do with it or how to make sense of it um so yeah so that might have been more than you were looking for but that's kind of how how i got i I, I love it i I love the journey that that books cause yeah but it's all based on bullshit right i mean (laughs) when when when, you know just to summarize it wait what is my fuck the patriarchy shirt on yes um but i mean you know when like when mike johnson the speaker of the house said you know a month or so ago now that he believes you know he lives a biblical life I'm thinking, really, how many mistresses do you have? Yeah, exactly. How many wives how many do, you have? do you have? Yeah, right. You know, yeah. are are you killing your children for being disrespectful? Exactly. Are, yeah. You know, all of these things. Yep. And it's 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 ignorance. It's I was it ignorant. Like I, I said, I totally bought into it. It was just what I believed and what the structure it's like was. Kind of brainwashing. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. and and so mm-hmm. not only does it will it help educate the men to go okay. I never thought about Solomon. I never thought about, you know, David and Bathsheba being more than a loving relationship. You know, all of these things that have been twisted into a narrative that the patriarchy wants. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's interesting, too, because when you talk about like, my mother has said this to me so many times while I was working on this book. She's like, I used to have, because she was a pastor. And she's like, I would have people come up to me and ask me to marry them. And they'd say, and we want to have a biblical marriage. And she would just say, 
well, which version? Yeah. <laughs> which version yeah. do you want to emulate and why? Because none of them yeah, are good. Does, does that mean hundreds of wives and mistresses? Exactly. You know? Yeah. So I realized, you know, I kind of needed to address what do people mean when they refer to biblical marriage and yeah. then address, um, which is just four passages, by the way, you know, four passages that define what people tend to mean by biblical marriage. And then and then I spent some time and then I spent time looking at, well, what do marriages actually look like and how are they actually yeah. talked about in the Bible? And then the final three chapters, you know, some things that are related that I think ought to be part of this conversation. So it's more than I, that was the way I, I settled on how to how to tackle it, because there's so much. Right. Yeah. And I specifically decided not to do the the clobber passages because. Those aren't specifically di directly about marriage. Specific, those they are about sex, but they're not about marriage. And so I was trying. That was one way to try to keep things focused. Um, if, you know, if it's pertaining to marriage, then that's what I'm going to talk about. And that's how we'll. we'll this we'll is a great comment. This. How many goats did you have to yeah, trade for this fine woman? <laughs> right, right. I mean, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, oh my gosh! Look at the look at the first comment. Maybe you already put that up on the screen. I was I just did. talking. I did. I'm that's sorry. What, that's we put TJ. it back up. We put put it back up. I'm a queer American Baptist candidate. I love that. And my husband and I are also the first gay couple to be legally married. I mean, that's so cool. So cool. Yeah. yeah. TJ's awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, TJ, I don't get your comment about how many boyfriends does he have. Um, did that? Who's that referring to? Oh, probably uh, jo uh, Mike Johnson. Oh. A I, I'm, I live a biblical I would guess life. That. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Guess. Yeah. I, I can totally see that. Yeah, I mean, when we were talking backstage about the Ten Commandments briefly, um, but when women were listed as property in the Ten Commandments, when you have that stupid umbrella of God, husband, what, you know, all of that. The Ephesians 5 passage. That, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, it makes everything into a property and it's my way or not this way. I mean, I remember my ex-husband saying, this is what God says, mm. you know, and, and, and I'm like, I don't know, you know, and, and mm -hmm. freaking out about this because I mean, I had just had a child. I wasn't even mm -hmm. supposed to be doing any of this, but because God said so, mm -hmm. I had to demean myself and to, you know, lay there in pain. Um, and it was all justified for that. So when you have people discriminating against gay couples for marrying, or you have women as property, I mean, how could it be godly in those senses, right? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's okay, I've healed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just sorry for all that you've been through. Um, yeah, pertaining to this in particular on this particular issue. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think. Um, I mean, people want some direction. People want guidance, and it's um, it's just uh, cherry picking. Really, it seems to me yeah. is what you know what, what everybody does, and so you know, wanting, you know, saying that it's going to be only between a man and a woman, you know, Genesis 128 and Genesis 2, or uh, that it'll be fruitful, right? That they'll, you'll have children. I mean, that, just that in and of itself is so harmful to a lot of hetero couples, you know, like yeah, who can't, who can't or don't want to. And, yeah. you know, or, or they get married after 65, like what, you know, like this yeah. isn't what we're doing here anymore, people, Um, you know, and, and the, the no sex before marriage, which is read, into Genesis 2.24, which is, you know, I mean, that's one of my favorite passages to talk about with students because just watching all the reactions, the facial reactions when they when they learn that the Hebrew doesn't have a word for wife, that's your translation committee, you know, telling you to think about the fact that to believe that since they end up having sex at the end of this verse, then we're going to make sure they get married at the beginning of this verse. Like, yeah. you know, it's not in the Hebrew that way. And so when you start reading, you know, any of these passages in any part of the Bible for Hebrew Testament or newer Testament that we, I don't think we should be using labels like husband and wife because they're not there in the original. Yeah. Um, that's so fun to talk about, but also really far reaching and, um, you know, yeah, so I, I mean, it's it's moving it from an ownership mentality to a partnership mentality. I mean, I love that the LGBTQ community has 
transformed our language where straight couples are actually saying partners now. You know, it was when someone said, oh, my partner years ago, it was like, oh, they're gay. But now it's becoming so fluent and people are using this as a way to describe them as opposed to any type of ownership issues. And it also um, makes the LGBTQ community not stand out so much, but but be more inclusive mm-hmm. uh, because of those designations. Mm-hmm. So what was your favorite discovery in, in all this? You know, the, my favorite discovery was in uh, came in working on the third of the three of the four biblical passages the passages that define biblical marriage. Matthew nineteen four to six is what people usually turn to to, to say this defines biblical marriage, which is to say no divorce. <laughs> um, but there were two things that occurred to me. Well, one thing that occurred to me, and then one thing that I read about was had just not really spent any time thinking about it and hadn't looked into it before in relation to that. So the thing that was, for whatever reason, it was really fun to realize this, to come to this realization that Jesus is also being very objectifying of women um, in this passage. I, I don't want to assume that people know what we're talking about, but this is a passage where he he's approached by uh, some Pharisees and they are saying, for which reason do you approve of divorce? Um, and he he plays out the whole exchange in the way that we know uh, Jewish scholars or Jewish studiers of the law were already doing for a couple hundred years. It's not like there's anything new at the beginning of this passage. Mm-hmm. Jesus is just quoting the way you have this conversation, this debate or banter. And, you know, did, did you not read that in the beginning God made the male and female and that... Um, and does he quote also Genesis two twenty four? Anyway, so they do this thing back and forth. Well, then why? And and so you know, there's no divorcing. And well, then why did Moses give us a command to to give her a certificate and send her away? Well, that's because your hard hearts. It wasn't that way from the beginning, but God, you know, allowed you to. But I say, and so and it cuts off at it cuts off at this thing where Jesus is is kind of throwing the gauntlet that like you know, um, I feel like I need to get it and read it. Hang on a second. I just don't want people to not be aware of what the past is saying. I love this. Okay. Okay. Um, because I often like misquote it in from memory and then that just looks really weird that I keep doing that. <laughs> so not, not very helpful. Okay. So what people quote is this part. They don't quote the, the prompt, which says some Pharisees came to him and to test him, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? Which is a nod to there are two different camps that uh, in terms of which uh, in terms of whether or not you can divorce. One camp says only if there has been um, infidelity and the other camp says for any reason that you that you deem. And that has been was played around with, you know, like if she's a bad cook, <laughs> you know, like and that's and that's whether or not it's true. Or couldn't bear children. Right. Right. Yeah. And and so people come in and say, see, Jesus is actually protecting women here because he's saying to not divorce for no re- to not be so take it so lightly, to take it much more seriously. And, and and I believe that and agree with that, but that's not the full picture from my perspective. So what people quote is four to six, which are these three verses. He answered, Have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made the male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his woman, my English says wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Oh, yeah, God. this is, and this is, yeah. Je- yeah, Jesus doesn't quote this as original to him. He's just exactly. trotting out the conversation. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of people think that this is Jesus making this pronouncement. No, this is a Jewish idea that's out there already. What, what people don't realize, though, is the that it continues. And that's when they push back and we're like, well, then why did you know Moses tell us to give her a certificate? And he's like, it's because you were so hard hearted. Wasn't the way from the beginning. And I say to you, and this is that Methian Jesus thing where he takes the Jewish law and he ratchets it up like four or five mm-hmm. levels. Whoever divorces his woman except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. And so, and then, so this is one of the things I loved was, dis- was realizing that Jesus is also agreeing with his Jewish scriptures in terms of women being property of men that are claimed by the sex act. 
Oh, wow. I've never, I've never read it that way. Wow. Yeah. And that this whole idea about the, the reason that divorce is a problem is not that you're going to pull apart these, these, this bond. It's not that it's going to be hard for the children. It's not that you're going to, what if you actually enjoyed your in-laws and you, and you have, you don't have them in your life anymore. It's not the financial duress. It's not the, the, you know, it's not that it's sex. It's yeah. the fact that you will likely remarry, which means you are going to have sex with someone else, which means you're going to be committing adultery on the first. The focus on this control of bodies, specifically around sex, is really stunning. And yeah. I don't hear people talking about that. So that feels really important to me to say, right, that Jesus is also playing into this really horrific way of thinking about bodies and sex and relationships. But the even more exciting thing comes in reading when I read, when I stumbled across this article about eunuchs in the first century and talking about this passage. So the next three verses, um, I'm, is it okay if I go ahead and read those as well? Of course. Yeah. Okay. So, so starting in verse 10, his, his disciples essentially are freaking out because and they say, if such is the case of a man with his woman, I, I don't know, I always do this on my live stream, so I'm going to do it here. Um, my, I say woman, but the English says wife. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, it, is better, it is better not to marry. And he said to them, he doesn't say, oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. <laughs> he actually just ignores their comment, which is a way of saying, yes, it's better not to marry. Right. That's yeah. fun. Let's talk about that. Jesus actually says it's better not to marry. What? Not your family values guy. And then he goes on to say, not everyone can accept this teaching, but only those to whom it is given. Yeah. So he's doing a redirect, a very bizarre, tangential kind of not addressing the question. And for there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven let anyone accept this who can. Yeah. And so that to me, and then learning more about eunuchs, historically speaking, right, was just eye-opening. Cause I, you know, I remember asking a guy, some some guy had been was just pestering me on Twitter one time, and I was like, fine. So just out of curiosity, when are you and your buddies gonna castrate yourselves for the kingdom? Because, <laughs> and well, that shut him up. But, you yeah. know, it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I I keep having these images of, you know, promise keeper, you know, gatherings and having a tent marked Matthew 19, you know, for the for the real men, you know, or whatever. <laughs> oh, like, my God. And the clipper out. Yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> but also. Yeah. Right. But also Unix. So there's a lot of debate about this. But so, you know, there are certain other religious traditions that had castrated men that would be the priest for that particular mm -hmm. religious tradition. And so is this a, is this a bat? Is this a counter to that? Is that what's going on? Whatever the case in the first century, Unix and prior to and after, right? So th there's a long tradition of thinking about Unix and talking about them as if they are third gender and knowing, and, and regardless of whether or not all Unix do participate this way, they have a reputation for being adept at sex with both men and women. I saw that you posted that video um, and I <laughs> haven't had a chance to I look keep, into it. Yeah. There I kind of keep so repeating. Many, yeah. Good. There's so many debates on this show about Unix because of all of the LGBTQ plus conversations sure. that I've had. Sure. And that is something that I never discovered of them. You know, in fact, what in, in my studies, I found that they were trusted to be among the women because the men weren't threatened by them. They weren't going to be, you know, having affairs or anything like that. And then some people also assert that eunuchs were a form of punishment or enslavement, not by choice or sure. by birth. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's what you know, when he says people some are made eunuchs by others. That's what he's yeah, referring to. Yeah. So how does all that work? I mean, were they really the you know the ancient sex dolls? I mean, is that no, actually some were. And what's interesting is what you pointed out, which is some scholars are saying that the reason they're trusted in the concubinages is because they wouldn't be having sex. No, that is really funny because just because you don't have your testes doesn't mean you're not interested in sex and aren't still capable of it. True. And this is a, this is an assumption coming from fully testicled males. 
<laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. oh, well, he's not, you know, like all the things. I've had some people tell me that it's impossible for a castrated man to have sex. I'm like, you know what? First of all, sex is more than just penis and vagina. Exactly. So even if he can't get it up anymore, but some still could, by the way, yeah. <laughs> some still could. But even if he can't, sex is more than just a man ejaculating inside a woman. Like, yeah. And I say that hetero framework on, in, on purpose, um, you know, so it's like you have really boring sex lives if you well, are I mean, thinking that also, an erection is the only way a man can participate in sex. Well, that's all that matters, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Is it, which is why this book is so necessary. That's why we all need to read this book, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, my God. I love her. Yes. I, I have shared her so many have you? times. That's yes. awesome. Yep. Anyway, so... <clears throat> Yeah. So back to Unix about, you know, historically speaking, um, they, you know, regardless of how many actually were, some were just enjoying it, you know, and there are, there are references. So you, that I actually linked the article to my website on the podcast tab because it is, it had so many people pushing back and asking and blah, blah, blah. And which was great. Yes. Thank you. On my website, um, on the podcast at the top, I have a reference to the podcast that I'm, um, co-creating. And then under that, I start, I've started um, linking articles that I'm referencing in okay, when yeah. I talk on podcasts and things like that. Yeah. So there's an article, there's an, it's a, uh, what's, what's the title? The post-gender Jesus. Um, I can't remember the whole title, but it's, it's great stuff. So. Well, and I just, I just want to um, add into that they had uh, prosthetics for penises back thousands right, of years exactly. so a, if they couldn't i mean it was you know we yeah. call it uh, they have drugs for it now but they yeah. found um I, I can't even think of the word where they would you know it was still be like a stick <laughs> a way to support it yeah, to, to, it, yeah. To, you know assert the firmness and be able to do what it right. needs without having that that erection i mean uh, yeah and there are yeah i mean and also Right. Can we just, I mean, it's just fascinating how many times people think it's only about that, right? A, a penis in an opening. Yeah. And it's, it, sex is so much more than that. Um, Hopefully. You know, and there are references in this article to, you know, like um, women, a lot of wealthy women preferred to have sex with uh, men who were castrated because it was, a you know, this guarantee on ch child, you know, yeah. um, protection from getting pregnant, you know, yeah. um, so it's really interesting to me how many, how people read the data and, and it's not surprising, but so, well, so just the demonization of sex in general is just so stupid. I mean, you know, it's like we are sexual beings exactly, and saying Most that, of us we must, mm -hmm. yeah, that we must be in a committed relationship or, you know, for life to, in order to enjoy that just seems like go, it goes against every way that we're structured. You know, I, I speak on the clitoris. The clitoris mm -hmm. is the only thing that uh, on the human body that is used solely for pleasure. Um, and so religions uh, across the world have them cutting cut it off. It, you know, right. yeah, cut it off. Mm -hmm. um, not for the man, only for the women. You know, don't have her exactly. enjoying those sexual yeah. activities. Right. So there was a question uh, that came up uh, saying, and I, um, where is it? Oh. I say yes. The question is, is marriage just a social yeah. control device to, or a cultural device to control women? And, it, you know, to lock them down, because again, Solomon <laughs> had hundreds, you know, Abraham, it's biblical that he got a mistress. All of these things are counterintuitive to what we view marriage as now. Yeah, I, I, you know, and Sherry, I would actually, I, I don't want to call Hagar a mistress. I mean, he, he was you know, he, he, he was forced upon her. I don't want to call that a mistress. Okay. Okay. I hear you on that. That's a very I, good I want to say that she was raped by him. Yeah. Just very in it, much the same way that many enslaved peoples have been over the centuries. Yeah. Right. Um, but I, I mean, I appreciate. And the this is why point. it's so important to read Jennifer's book because yeah. of this type of stuff, well, you know, you. I mean, our you. words matter. And by they saying, do. 
um, yeah, she was a slave. She, you know, had those. But yeah, I mean, she had no choice. And you know, and people again, push back on that. The thing is, you know, oh no, they were, uh, you know, yeah. Mistress, well, she know. was, she was game. She went, she was happy yeah. to play along. I've had people say that to me. I'm like, oh really? Okay. There's no way we can ha we can have a conversation about this because we don't know. But also, but I also back to the question or the comment. The social construct of marriage is is about control. It is about, it's also about inheritance. It's about that mm -hmm. those, you know, it's about money. Um, but I discovered um, a, the existence of, gr of groups of people that, again, I'm looking at my bookcase because I didn't know we'd be talking about it. Hang on a second. Um, uh, I told you she was a I, boss bitch. I thought, I meant, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure where it is. So okay. there's a there's a book that I discovered that's talking about. I'm sorry, my hair is. A, I'm having a bad hair month. Um, the the na the the na people in China, um, function without husbands and fathers, meaning, the women. So men visit women. They sneak in through the window, and, um, you know, women might have multiple sexual partners. They might have just a study, but they don't stay overnight. It's just, we're hanging out. You come in, we have a good time. And when a woman gets pregnant, she is, she's living with her brother. And so you have a close knit family rearing the children mm. and the children don't necessarily know who their father, their paternity father, paternal father is. So that's what it means by when they say they, they function without fathers and husbands, because that's not nobody cares. like that's not a concern we don't care yeah. right we're just we just care about taking care of the child and rearing the child well and, and safe and feeling safe and so so the fact that there have been multiple groups of people over the centuries over the millennia who have functioned this way i think is just delightful because it's a well, for we me did too though right i mean the the ancient tribes the men were off fighting hunting they would come back for sex and food and to bring you know their their spoil to everything and then they would leave for months women ran everything until civilization started and the men were home more and that's when they went no we have to rule but women were doing everything before we had to run the cultures because the men were off killing things sure yeah yeah but but even with that there was there are were strict um ways of talking about controlling the women there were strict expectations of the women that they would still be faithful while he's gone um, because we want to make sure that we know who the, who the father is. I mean, that, that is, that was still the case. I would suggest, but, you know, yeah, it doesn't mean the reality. With, yeah. With, with inheritance. Right. I mean, it would, it would cause the total chaos within the tribe. I get it. Yeah. Uh, especially because of pregnancy. But it was only initiated because of property and insecurities, though, right? Right, 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 right. And so, it is ultimately a, a way to control women. I do yeah. I do agree with that comment. Um, I just was trying to get at kind of a more complex way of even appreciating what it is that um, in a... No. Nah. <laughs> That's awesome. Nah. Nah. <laughs> and the, the nah people are spelled N-A, just to be clear. But yes, I like that. That's fun. Um, you know, but, but but humans have figured out a way to live that doesn't have this ridiculous control over the baby yeah. makers, right? And allows people to live the way they want to live. And that, to me, is highlights the level of control, right? Yeah. Highlights the level of uh, yeah, this, this form of control over women's bodies in particular. And so many people don't, I don't think just, just don't see it. You don't see that that's what's going on. And all this, this conservative back, you know, swing all the different ways that all the legislation that's being passed and the court cases that are being brought, it's frightening because it's all about, it all plays out on women's bodies. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, I've been saying it for five or six years now that they really want to turn us into a theocracy like Iran, um, you know, or Iran, sorry. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, out mm -hmm. of control, it's like when you can't, women are um, the majority in universities now. We are, you know, getting to the tops of businesses. We are really excelling and that is freaking out the conservatives. And once again, they're using God to control us. And in doing so, we only have death and chaos and people suffering um, for fragile male egos. Yeah. 
So, ha- so your book is going to fix this all. <laughs> well, you know, the, what got me doing this is people say that the Bible says X, Y, and Z about marriage. I'm like, okay, yeah. no, let's yeah. be serious. Let's take this very deeply seriously. What does the Bible say, what do those four passages that people think mean this, say this, what do they actually say? And in context, what are, what's going on? It's actually much more complex. Um, you know, the second passage, Genesis 2, 24, people say no sex before marriage. That verse makes it, that verse doesn't say that they don't actually get married because there isn't a, la- a label for marriage yet. Um, and, you know, there's kind of a playful way that I used to kind of talk about it, but it's maybe not as helpful. It's not super helpful, but in the Hebrew Bible, at least you couldn't have sex before marriage because having sex is what made you married. (laughs) Yeah. Except when it was man having sex with a woman he didn't want to marry. And so that was just on the side and we just, you know, forgive that, but you couldn't (laughs) have sex, you know, like, yeah. Anyway, but that's, that's not super helpful, but anyway, so like, let's just talk about what they are saying and let's talk about what the Bible does say about marriage. Let's talk about all the whole range of things, the laws. So one of the chapters, matriarchs, patriarchs, laws, and adultery. What do the laws say about human beings that are talking about marriage in any kind of way? What, you know, in terms of the laws, what is the problem with adultery, right? The problem with adultery is when a man has sex with someone else's property, someone else's woman. It doesn't matter if the man involved is married or married in our terms or not. Um, This is all about the sex act. It is all about territory, women's bodies as territory and men being wanting to be the only one there, the only one on the scene, you know, the only one having access to that woman's body. And it's, it's really deeply disturbing. And, you know, so many people today are still focused, still the the issue of, you know, same-sex marriage, it's all and only about the form of sex that will be have had within that relationship. And the thing is, the Christian Bible, the two testaments, teach people of faith to think about it this way. The only time Jesus even talks about marriage, it's in it's Matthew 19, right? And it's and no divorce. And the reason there's no divorce is because because women's bodies are territory. And then Paul, the only time Paul talks about marriage directly, not in the things where they're talking to, I mean, the things to men and women in the Deuteropolitan letters, you know, the household code things. That's not what I'm referring to. But when Paul talks about the thing of marriage, the only time he does it is in relation to whether or not you should be having sex if you're married. Yeah, Coming from a man who, who claims to not to be celibate and wishes everybody was as he were, but the, but like the only time marriage is directly being talked about is through the lens of sex. No wonder Christians have a hard time. No wonder so many monotheistic people have a hard time getting past the kind of sex that will be involved. They believe it needs to be procreative, blah, blah, blah. Let's talk about that. We can deconstruct that. Right. But like, no one talks about marriage as a relationship that needs devotion and patience and, you know, kindness. And you know what I mean? Like it just. The oh, friendship, the partnership, none the, of it. the being able to yes. live together. Now, do you think that was because of the ancient times and maybe they just, I mean, we, the uh, non-canonical gospels and stuff like that show that Jesus had really deep relationships with women and talked to them and listened to their voice. Mm -hmm. But because of the ancient times, women didn't have a voice. They were stupid. They were doing it. So do you think that that evolved because there wasn't that relationship? It was a construct of power. Now it's more like you have to marry your best friend. Back then it was a social status, uh, you know, money, finances, like someone said, oh, you know, how much, how many goats did you get for her? Mm-hmm. All of those types of things. Mm-hmm. Do you think that it's just evolved into this relationship or that there always was one and it was just demeaned? Oh, okay. Um, well, there's a book called Marriage by Kuntz, K-O-O-N-T-Z, Stephanie Kuntz, I think. I think. I one, yeah, really good. Um, kind of a overarching kind of a quick history of the relationship we call marriage and that, you know, the romantic element doesn't enter until the late 19th century yeah. in terms of, in terms of marriages. Um, so I do think if I'm understanding your question, Sherry, I, I mean, I do think that it's very, it is about 
the practicality of it all, right? You know, the need to, the need to survive, the, the yeah. desire to have your goods passed along to people you know and love, not just any, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and, and you want someone to cook and clean for you, you know, like, yeah, that's, that's, that's what it was. And it changed very recently yeah. um, to be about soulmates. And there's another, there's an element in the only heteros chapter where talking about, you know, this was another discovery for me. I, I hadn't, I was vaguely familiar with it, but I hadn't spent time with it. Um, but, you know, ancient friendships are the closest thing to what most people's marriages look like today. Mm -hmm. So, and ancient friendships were between people of the same sex and they were for life. And they were, Jonathan and yes. And this whole like soulmate language that yeah. was that you, the only place that was used was in friendships. Yeah. Um, and so it's an interesting thing to me. To I disagree that they were friendships, but yeah, <laughs> I get your point. I, I mean, I, I think that they were labeled as friendships too. So people didn't clutch their pearls, but I mean, we know that Dave and Jonathan got naked together. We, you know, we, we know, uh, I mean, the Ruth and Naomi uh, quotes are used in heterosexual marriages all the time. And that was between two women. And I'm sorry, there is no one in history that loves their daughter-in-law that much. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think, I think we're missing each other here. Um, I'm trying to talk about ancient friendships in general. Oh, okay. That ancient friendships, the way they're talked about between two same-sex people, that that construct is the closest thing to modern marriages. Yeah. Not anything that's in the Bible in yeah. terms of marriages. Nothing in the Bible about marriage is what people today look to to define their marriage. Yeah. Um, there is no example of a of a mutually entered into by two equals and based on love marriage in the Bible. There isn't yeah. one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, you know, the French, the David and Jonathan, I think is really interesting because it, it, it's not so clear cut to me. Um, I think that Jonathan was in love with David for sure. And I think David took advantage of that. And, um, Ooh, that's an you know, twist. To, to, well, he could tell, and David is very conniving and manipulative, right? His whole career, he's just using people. Oh, totally. Yeah. Right. So I, I, you know, I don't have a, I actually don't have a dog in the fight in terms of whether or not David was bisexual or, or was a gay man. And but he seemed to enjoy women too much to be only, you know, so yeah. I, I think for sure, Jonathan was in love with David. You know, his soul was, was, um, clean, you know, he cleaved, he, you know, uh, yeah. Clung to his soul. What's, what's the language there in, in first, in first Samuel 18 it's and 20, clean, isn't it? Um, but you know, we only, this is the only soulmate language in the in the entire Christian Bible, right? Is yeah. here Jonathan's feelings for David. I think that needs to be respected as what it is, which is the man was in love with this man, right? Yeah. Whether or not David reciprocated or did so out of manipulation, you know, like that's a whole nother it thing. It just wasn't a thing like it is now, though. I mean, the 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 Greeks are known for their sexual escapades. It just wasn't a thing like it is now. I mean, it, it, it just wasn't. It was more, far, far more normal, far more natural, all of that. Right? Oh, I'm not entirely yeah. sure what you're talking about. So I'm not sure what to say. Um, <laughs> what was much more natural and I, I don't know. Homosexuality. I mean, now it's this sin and it's it's all, you know, back then the, the, the Greeks, I, I mean, there were names for everything. I, I you know, I dress in my book as well as the movie of 1946 and homosexuality being changed in the Bible. You know, the problem back then was pederasty, not same-sex loving relationships like it is now. Right. I are you missing me still? I'm still missing. I guess I'm still missing the thread. It doesn't matter. We can move okay, on. Yeah. We can move anyway, on. We're I, on. I, um, <laughs> I mean, I think that people in, you know, I think that there are plenty of people who still, um, who were uncomfortable with homosexual relationships at any point in time. I think there, there are reasons why Paul is um, probably... Was probably just ashamed of himself. I mean, I, I mean, I think that there, 
the language that Paul uses to deride um, sexual encounters between two men tells me that just like now, there were plenty of people who were taught by their traditions to to fear something they didn't understand, right? And so there was well, a lot of and judgment. it was also a, a class issue too, because normal was man and woman. So that was where uh, the children came from, which were superior. If you were, you know, everything was to nurture and, and flood our planet with people. So if you couldn't do that, um, it was it was more of a, well, you're not as good as us. But across the, the, the research that I've done and what I've seen in talking with the people who did the research on the 1946 movie, it really wasn't. I mean, they, it has this whole growth of hatred. That, that has just permeated um, like the Leviticus chapter. And it was really more for sexual um, uh, shrine wor worship, all of those things. But I mean, it's it's really a new hatred um, for the LGBTQ community. I assert that the centurion um, that was actually asking for his lover to be mm -hmm. healed and Jesus mm -hmm. would have recognized that because mm -hmm. Workers didn't live in their homes, you know, those types of things. But we've really demonized it now because we like to other everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you hope um, that everybody will get out of this? With more clarity, less judgment? Well, I do hope that there's more clarity on how different marriage is being talked about in the Bible versus the way most people, not everyone, but the way most people today tend to talk about marriage, even when it's cases of arranged marriages. Uh, our next door neighbors are, um, have been married 35 years and they're from India and they they were in arranged marriage. You know, and we were talking about, talking about that with them this past week. You know, but even, even though it was arranged, the way they live their marriage is, you know, is like the way Christians live their marriage, right? So when yeah. we're talking about marriage in the Bible, you know, this idea of biblical marriage. Yeah, I just really want people to be better informed. And and what comes from that could be a lot of different things. I would love for people who are, who have, who discover that their children are, um, their child is a lesbian, child is trans, their child is a gay man, you know, like that there, there would be a way for that not to be terrifying. <laughs> But that yeah. they could, you know, that there's openness and understanding and love that this is your child this is who they are. Just it, it's just deal with it. And let's stop using these 3000, 2000, 3000 year old texts exactly. to make you think that you have to disapprove of that. Um, yeah. There are a lot of things, I hope, I guess. But I think that better understanding can lead to lots of different things. Um, I will also say someone asked me recently what um, what's the one thing that people don't ask me about or that don't talk about much that I would like for them to know. And so I thought I would just throw this in here. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a postscript on Augustine in this book because his ideas around sex, sexuality, marriage, and sinfulness, the, the church, not just Roman Catholics, but the church still embrace. And um, I don't know... I didn't, it wasn't appropriate to bring it into the main part of the book because the book is talking about marriage in the Bible. And so Augustine is not biblical. Yeah. He is fifth century. Um, but it's just so important. It's so important what had the influence he's had over people and in particular around this idea of sex before marriage is sinful uh -huh. as, as well. I mean that and the whole thing about sex needs to be procreative. So those two pieces of what a lot of people today unconsciously sometimes are hung up on, right, come from Augustine. And his language and everything about him is just much more um, negative than most people realize. So I, I was trying to find a creative way to engage some of his writings on this and to show people just how deeply detrimental, how, just how, how, how far, hmm, how his rhetoric, his rhetoric is violent and judgmental and negative. And, and it's anyway, and so that, yeah. And it, yeah. And it just, so, so that postscript was actually really important to me. It feels like the most important part of the whole book, uh, but I don't think it's going to get much attention. <laughs> so I'm happy if people have a better understanding about marriage and that's fine. <laughs> well, I, I think that 
that people better go buy this book before it's banned. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Oh my gosh. You know, because yeah. if someone would have told me this when I was 18, I would not have been forced into marriage. If someone would have, you know, told other people, yeah. my ex-husband, right before he passed away, we saw each other and he was in the middle of divorcing his third wife. And I'm like, dude, Mm-hmm. huge evangelical, I mm-hmm. mean, evangelical life. And I said to him, why do you think fornication is a worse sin than adultery? You know, adultery is making an actual vow to God. Uh, fornication, you know, it doesn't have any, it goes, how did you know this? Where did you learn all these things? And he wouldn't have gotten married to his third wife if he, they would have been able to have sex before. All of these things mm-hmm. that control people's lives when it's not even correct, when it's not even an educated thing Mm -hmm. is what's so important. You know, I mean, this will stop child brides. Mm -hmm. This will stop people from being told that, you know, this is what you have to do. It was only like 15 or 20 years ago that I realized, oh, I don't have to be with every man that likes me. You know, it, it's, it's that conditioning because if a guy liked it me, is. then God brought him to me and yeah. yep. my feelings didn't matter. Right. right? He likes me. Right. I got to be with him. Got to do something with this guy. Yeah. yeah. And those types of things are so detrimental to our society, mm-hmm. to our peace, to our freedom, all of that. Mm-hmm. And having that information will empower people. Thank you. It, you know, I hope, hopefully it does it now. Someone just said they're pro fornication. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but because of these things is why I never got married again. I mean, my ex-husband joked that he goes, you're so smart. You never got married again. I'm like, look, I learned from my mistakes. There is no way that I would ever put myself, whether it be someone religious or say, I just have this fermented belief that men look at their wives as property. You know, whether it be based in religion, whether it be based on society or just patriarchal standards, there's still that even on a subconscious level, I think, mm-hmm. um, for most men, don't give me, don't, don't email me, not all and all of that. But I mean, it, it, it's a true problem in our planet, not it only is. in the U.S., it on is. the planet. I agree. I agree. Yeah. 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 I remember when I was uh, in graduate school, I was doesn't matter how, but I, I was talking to some people about, about what I was working on, blah, blah, blah. And somehow the conversation came up that there had been the legislature in the state of Tennessee. That's where I was in grad school had someone had, they'd brought forth a bill they wanted to pass that would make it, put it in the, in the law that a man raping his wife needs to be punished. And they had to bring it to the floor 15 years in a row because so many men said, it's not possible for me to rape my wife. She's my prop, you know, she's my wife and I will have sex with her whenever I want. And it's not rape because she consented to marry me. Yeah. 15 years in a row, Sherry. I, I have actually had this conversation in the last two in the last year with three different men, and they said the exact same things. That's exactly. stupid. You can't rape your wife. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. And, nope. and my and my head explodes. And totally. It's like, I had yes, somebody writing can. in my writing in the comments. The the only consent I need is that she consented to marry me. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and again, that's you know, I've been engaged a bunch of times, um, but I, I think that. I've always been very clear. In fact, the last time I got engaged, a dear friend was like, this has to be a hoax. Sherry said she'd never get married again. I've known her for 30 years. There's no way. I was like, oh, no, I can get engaged. I'm just not walking down that aisle. I'm not being that property again. Hmm. And I'm sure there are a ton of men out there who, you know, would just think that was disgusting that I would even say that, you know, that they may think of me as property. But that's the exception, not the rule, fellas. I'm sorry to say it. It It, it really really is. is. Yeah. The good people, good people here don't think that way, but plenty of yeah. people do. Plenty of people yeah. do. Yeah. And I keep having to put a YouTube user in timeout. I saw um, that. I'm sorry. I don't yeah, know. yeah, that's okay. Live streams are good. I've got controls. I've got the control now. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
women have no personhood in traditional cultures. That is 100%, Joel, 100%, you know, and that's what we are here to talk about because you can't love us and try and own us at the same time. It's just an impossibility. You know, and the, the, the passage in Ephesians 5 that people turn to um, comes from that longer passage that you were referring to earlier at the beginning, um, you know, as God is, you know, head over Christ and Christ is head over the church. So the, well, yes, Christ is head of the church. So the man is the head over the woman and, yeah. and all that. Um, where was I going with this? Um, oh, shoot. Oh, right. Well, within that passage, you know, it, at the beginning, it does say, it does in the middle of it, it does tell men to love their women. It does tell them mm -hmm. to, to love them. And this is progress in the first century. This is actually progressive. Um, what would be helpful is if people thought similarly today, what is progressive and loving and whatever. But, you know, when people, I've, I've had, I've had a female pastor actually tell me that that passage in Ephesians 5, the 21 to 32 or whatever, that she's, that that is loving and supportive of women and it is oh, wow. it's really amazing what people can find a way to the whole all the mental gymnastics find a way to make something work for them my mom used to but, say that what's that that it's that, that, that was you know, it says she said it says eight times in the bible where she used to give some number men love their wives because right. that's how important it was right right yeah. but and but it's but but scholars have called this love patriarchalism right so we're totally. gonna so yeah. we want you to love them but you're still in charge and you're still the head of the household and you're still controlling everything about them and um it just sounds like you know everything you know forces like people love their pets yeah i mean and it forces the issue of making creating this this divide creating the um like some of the wage gap issues because if men have to be the ones providing for the family then they gotta um and it also this whole passage the way it's the the language in that passage in terms of what men are supposed to do to take care of the women to love them it sounds like they're putting them on a pedestal and for some people this works it works for some to be um you know a kept woman and to be a stay-at-home person and whether or not their children you know like it works for some people and that's great but i can't dance on a pedestal like i take right. up too much room like right. i can't do it don't do that to me you know and like i've had someone like but well, i'm dancing on a pedestal. i'm like i don't care you're missing my point <laughs> <laughs> it works for a very small percentage of the population. The rest of us I, I just need said today, space. No one's beliefs should affect my life. Right. No, if right. I don't want that, then no. I shouldn't have to I'd be subjected to that because of your beliefs and what you think. That's why there are 7 billion people on this planet, because we don't always have to agree on the same things. But don't demean me or diminish my life because it doesn't align with your spiritual beliefs. Take away my power, man. Mm -mm. <laughs> I got the Medusa hair and all. Don't do it. She can dance on a pedestal. She's a professional. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> I take up way too much space to be able to do that. <laughs> Hello, David. How are you? Oh, you guys, it's been such a great show. Okay. Any final words and where can people find you? Yeah. Thank you, Sherry. Um, the easiest way to find me is to go to my website, jennifergracebird.com. You can get to my Patreon page from there. You can get to my YouTube channel. Um, I do some Instagram, TikTok, um, Facebook stuff. I do not do X. I, I stopped when it became X and it was just Good too for negative you. for me. Yeah. So, and you can get my book, um, yep, through Amazon or through the publisher. We're not sure how, hopefully it'll go into paperback soon so that it won't be quite as expensive. And I am currently working on the audio for it. So nice. that'll be available hopefully in a few months, a couple months. I also um, wanted to give a shout out for this oh, one, although I can't, I can't enlarge it, but um, permission right, grant, that's the audible start version. with that mm -hmm. one and then move to this one. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but you, you know, really people, it's just, let's work on love and, and not law. Ooh, you yes. guys aren't supposed to see that. Oh, <laughs> oh little teaser, little teaser. Oops. Some good things coming down the pike. Oh, yeah, exactly. Well, okay. So uh, go buy the book, Jennifer. I always love talking to you. Thank, thank you, you so for much for being me. on the show. Um, yeah, and you. I will see you backstage. Anything else? It's great. Thank okay. you for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming on. I'll talk to you in a second.
now do you see why I call her a box bitch? I wasn't lying. I, you know, I, I, I use that sparingly, actually, and she deserves every bit of it. Ah, another great show. I love learning things from really smart people um, who are trying to make a difference in the world. If you, and thanks for all your comments and questions, you guys made the show. Yes, she's brilliant, isn't she? Yes, I see that too. If you like the show, share it um, and subscribe and all of that. We are headed over to the Fireside VIP Lounge to continue the discussion. And for only $3 a month, you can join us and get a chance to talk to the panel. Go to sherrypalace.com. Where is that link for you guys? Because everybody spells my name wrong, just like Dallas, except with a P. Um, go there, click on the support and subscribe tab. And thanks again for watching. Have a wonderful week. I will see you next Tuesday. And as always, walk in love. Mwah!